Good morning. Welcome to Policy Breakfast in June of the Citizens Club of Springfield. And I want to uh, thank our special guest this morning for joining us, the Honorable Jim Langfelter, Mayor of the City of Springfield. It's been in my calculation uh, about one year, one month, I was going to say one week, but I think it's been a little <laughs> over a week. Uh, you, uh, your father spent uh, eight hour, eight years as mayor, <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. Uh, you served 12 years, city treasurer. Right. How has the first year as mayor compared to what you expected? Oh, to what I expected, uh, really, you don't, uh, what I look back on and am thankful for is one for my father, you know, he's a great mentor, really taught me the importance of leadership. Uh, the other side of it is the magnitude of the mayor's office. You know, looking at Mayor Houston, he said, I love this job, and I could see why he loved it, because really you can change individuals' lives, you can change the city and the direction we're going. Uh, so from those standpoints, uh, you know, it's really uh, a lot greater impact uh, than you could ever imagine. Very good. Uh, I thought I'd start with the easy stuff, CWLP. I thought that was the hardest one. <laughs> uh, just before you were elected, uh, I visited Springfield, Missouri mm -hmm. and interviewed a number of the board members of their uh, utility board. Shortly after that, you visited Springfield, Missouri, I believe, and visited with your utility people. Uh, it's been a very busy year for CWLP, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you could update us on uh, what's been happening and uh, maybe looking ahead a little bit on uh, mm -hmm. where we're at. Well. Uh, First and foremost, thank you for going to Springfield, Missouri. And that's a great aspect of having the Citizens Club. They bring to the forefront uh, issues that are important to Springfield, and that's really where I got the idea to go visit them. So I appreciate you doing the legwork for me. <laughs> and so, uh, but he didn't refer me to them, just so you know, just for the record. So, uh, but that there's Springfield, Missouri, similar to the utility. Actually, when we built Dalman Four, they came and looked at our plant. And then when they built theirs, they took ideas we had. Uh, so there's some back and forth. And what I liked over there is, uh, you know, they have a different perspective with regards to information to the public. They have an advisory committee that uh, provides information. Uh, their governing board's a little bit different. Uh, of course, our governing board is the city council. But uh, the strides we have taken is really try to right the financial ship. And it's a great compliment to the citizens of Springfield because we did the rate restructuring. Uh, I think they understood the direction we were going. We raised the meter rate to make sure we have a more stable cash flow coming in month to month. And then we lowered the usage rate so we can be more competitive in the marketplace. Well, if you uh, look at the Sierra Club or those that want to tout green energy, that's opposite what everybody else in the country is doing. And the reason for that is we have a coal fire power plant out there, and that's what we're going to be burning for a long time, especially from the reports in, I think it was in today's uh, paper or the, today's media outlet. So, uh, you know, that's how we pay our bonds. We did refund the bonds, and uh, our timing was perfect because, uh, as you can see, with the, uh, the state's position, or their condition, I should say, uh, that has had an impact on other entities that are doing bond restructuring. So ours, you know, we stabilized uh, where we, the underwriters thought we'd have a downgrade. We actually had an uptick where we received stable ratings from Moody's, uh, which was previously negative outlook. So. Uh, that's due to the credit of the city council and, again, the citizenry. But the coal contract was a big issue because we reduced the price from $45 down to $36. And each dollar is a million dollar savings a year. That's what's estimated. And so um, that's a real misstep previously if you followed city council or CWLP is our projections are a little bit too rosy. I come from banking. I like to be more on the conservative side and make sure that you can deliver, and that's the direction we're taking financially. But we're not out of the woods. Uh, there's still a culture, just not within CWLP, but within city government, that we're here to serve the public. I think we have great workers, but really it's the mindset that we really need to see how we can better serve uh, more effectively, more efficiently to our citizenry. Uh, during the campaign, there was a discussion on uh, utility advisory board of mm -hmm. some nature. Uh, I believe even when the commissioner ran CWLP, there was an advisory committee. Uh, certainly, uh, city council had a utility committee uh, for a long time. Uh, any further discussion on how you might want to approach something on that order? And mm -hmm. the point being that 
it would be an entity that both the council and CWLP and you mm -hmm. would be able to would be able to reflect concerns, discussions, uh, seemingly would iron out some of the problems like questionable wind contracts mm -hmm. or right. or other kinds mm -hmm. of activities. And uh, first on the wind contracts, if uh, that's the mentality we have to have be more proactive. What's the future bringing our way? And that's what we want to do is control our financial destiny instead of uh, situations controlling us, which happened with uh, the building of Dolman 4 and entering those contracts. Because if we took a little foresight, uh, we probably should have uh, partnered like Springfield, Missouri did uh, with an entity that could build a wind farm and then we could re uh, receive some of the benefits of that. Unfortunately, we have a, you know, it's going to be probably over $100 million spent on wind contracts and we have nothing to go show for it. You know, it's gone with the wind. But uh, with, regards to the, with regards to the advisory group, that's something uh, first and foremost the city council has to be informed and it's no uh, secret that CWLP hasn't been as forthcoming uh, I think the general public feels that way uh, the aldermen have felt that way not with this particular administration but previous ones where they weren't getting as much information as needed to make those complex decisions so that's been a philosophy of uh, my administration is let's give them as much information you can uh, so you can make those decisions so uh, what I would like to see is that the city council would have had a separate meeting from a regular committee as a whole, separate out CWLP and just focus on that utility. But uh, unfortunately, they changed the dynamics of the committee as a whole, you know, so it prioritizes those sections. Uh, but what we are doing is having the open forums uh, to educate not only the public, but more importantly, the aldermen, so they can make those complex decisions. Where that takes us after that we go through those uh, public forums, uh, what we'll, we'll wait and see and uh, make a determination. One thing I've been uh, thinking about doing is bringing back some of the retirees because they could tell you what worked well in the past that we're not doing currently and then uh, utilizing their expertise and possibly uh, pointing out shortfalls or way we can make sure that we're doing the best job possible out at the utility. You had a public hearing a couple of weeks ago. Now you have do you plan two more? What, what's the program on that? Well, you know, I, I don't like to uh, tie myself down. You know, okay. I like to have a little gray area, no pun intended with your last name. I don't know. But, I um, but really, it's, uh, you know, so uh, the next one, we started off with the electric because there, that's where the interest was. And so I think the next session will be probably on the uh, production side, the uh, cost element, because 31 and 32 have been in the news, and, uh, you know, Sierra Club's had an interest on when is it economically possible to bring them offline and that's what we're going to take a look at as a city council is to make that determination it all comes down to dollars and cents when those units aren't making a profit that's when you take it offline uh, but up until then if we're making a profit we're going to keep those online as much as possible so uh, after that of course will be the water aspect and uh, everybody knows I'm a big uh, hopefully they know I'm a big proponent for Hunter Lake so that'll be the uh, next avenue we take after that, that. was my next question <laughs> Tell us a little bit about uh, your, your thoughts on Hunter Lake at this point. Well, uh, I think it's the right way to go. Uh, uh, unfortunately, with the situation in Chatham, I think it really dialed in everybody's uh, mindset on what the importance of water holds for our community. And then you had Flint, Michigan. You had the, the Colorado River that was polluted. So really, water is crucial for any community, especially ones that want to grow. Uh, we have a great medical community. Uh, we want to grow our industries as far as, you know, the economics of our uh, community. And to do that, I think Hunter Lake leads to that. So we have had a partnership with Department of Natural Resources. I think that's a great way to put it on the fast track, so to speak, uh, because we are going to keep it as a natural water, a body of water for recreational purposes and to serve our secondary source of water. Uh, Chatham has signed on, uh, so we will be providing them a backup water supply. So there are entities around us that want to use Springfield as a backup water supply, but we do not have a backup water supply. So that's really important to have Hunter Lake. We did meet with the Army Corps of Engineers, and uh, they like the aspect of keeping recreationally. They like the idea that it would be a regional uh, uh, provider of water uh, for those areas that may need it in the future. Very good. Uh, change topics a little bit, uh, downtown housing. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, a uh, building going up on 4th Street, mm -hmm. and uh, I think we're happy to have 
Uh, I'll tie in a discussion on the mansion block mm -hmm. because it seems to me that's almost the perfect opportunity mm -hmm. to, uh, to provide some additional housing. Um, talk about the Im talk about that, but talk about the impact that another 500 or so uh, downtown uh, housing opportunities would uh, would be for Springfield. I think uh, there was a housing study done by the Chamber of Commerce in downtown Springfield, and it pointed out that we could support uh, up to 400 units of housing. So it is important. I think everybody could tell you that it really takes bodies downtown, and I think where we saw the exodus or the downsizing of government and other entities from downtown, it's hurt businesses. So it's important to bring individuals uh, back to downtown as much as possible. With regards to housing or the mansion block, you know, we have two proposals. One is, uh, if you can go online to N NMB North Mansion Block, I think it's .com, but uh, you can Google it as well and you can see the two proposals. One was dealing with the YWCA and remodeling that. The other one was doing the whole block and doing a ha housing complex in conjunction with the uh, restoration of the YW. But uh, with that one, it's uh, concerning for me because I think it's too dense. It's 200 units, so you're talking, you know, we can provide housing for 400, but I don't, they wanted it spread out. I don't think they intended for 200 to be on one little block. And so uh, that's a concern. There was a concern with the work being done at the mansion that uh, you have landscaping and uh, renovations thanks to the governor taking uh, an interest in the mansion and really turning it back to the people's house of uh, Illinois and having that vista on the other side of the block. So those are d the dynamics we have to work with with regards to the North Mansion Block. Personally, what I was hoping for is more of a condominium or townhouse uh, proposal because then you have dollars actually coming in, people investing in downtown, and then the developers could take that money and reinvest it somewhere else. So uh, that's something that we have to work through that process to see what the right mix is for that. But uh, really, we applaud the ones that are doing the work, uh, like Rick Lawrence and others that are you know, trying to take our older buildings and turn them into modernized housing units. And those are the most expensive uh, ways to do things. And uh, that's an area that needs to be addressed because uh, otherwise the concern is you bring in a lot of new housing downtown on, on that North Mansion block. How's that going to impact those that want to redo the, or rehabilitate other buildings at usually a higher rate? So those are the complex issues we have to deal with. But what's important is that we have the downtown TIF extended. We are working with the state legislature. Uh, special kudos to uh, Representative Sue Shear that's helped with the House Democrats. Uh, you know, there's times that, you know, I don't side with them. There's times I do, but they've really helped in that initiative and uh, working out the language. And the other local legislative uh, legislators have uh, signed on, but uh, we're hoping that that does get extended at, by the end of this month. Very good. Piggybacking a little bit then on Jackson Street and some work that's been done over the, the last few years, um, a corridor from the Lincoln Home area, uh, and the idea originally was to go across Jackson Street all the way over to the 2nd Street to the mm -hmm. Capitol. Uh, actually, that's going to be cut off now because Jackson Street will be stopped at the uh, railroad tracks. However, that may even give a better opportunity uh, the Illinois, Illinois Realtors uh, have already shown a great deal of interest. They own the land between 5th and 6th uh, and are at least open to making that into a pedestrian walkway uh, and uh, so forth. The Executive Mansion is doing a lot of ideas, is kicking around a lot mm -hmm. of ideas, and the idea being that, that as you mentioned, the, the mansion could well open up. They're going to move their um, main entry, I think, to the north side, which is where it was originally. Uh, that would open up going into Jackson Street and then, in, and in my thinking, maybe the bottom third of the mansion block mm -hmm. and make that, in essence, green space. Mm -hmm. It could be lots of interesting stuff but, uh, and so forth. From a personal opinion, I, I think the, the Y, unfortunately, needs to be torn down, uh, but we'll see how that all works out. Talk a little bit about what working with the realtors and the mansion and, and how the city uh, might mm -hmm. sooner than later 
because they're ready to go. Mm -hmm. what, the, what you think they need out of the city and mm -hmm. what you think the city may be willing to be able to do. Mm -hmm. I have talked to uh, Gary Clayton and we appreciate the work that the Realtors Association's done, especially that beautiful facility that they invested in downtown. And again, the governor and uh, putting together that foundation to turn things around. So we are interested in the Jackson Street corridor uh, to just to the north is the Illinois Municipal League that has done work and then if you go to the west side at Illinois National Bank they've redone their facility so right. really uh, you have investors in that immediate area so uh, really I'm keeping the options open on what fits best but that's what you want is an open area that is inviting uh, that will be a magnet for either uh, individuals downtown or people to come downtown and so that's what we need to take a look at because you only ha have one shot at it. It's rare that you have a full block development available downtown so we want to do our best opportunity uh, possible. So what's interesting about the Jackson Street corridor is from the tracks, well maybe I guess you said maybe that will motivate maybe hopefully for 3rd Street corridor to go to 10th Street. I hope uh, so. Yeah, I and I, so. you know the governor is behind that so <laughs> we'll try to move those as fast as possible. Um, but uh, really that connects up to uh, the Capitol. But if you go the other side uh, to Lincoln's home area, if you go Lincoln's home area to the east, it links up with Lincoln Colored Home, which is the first black, uh, first orphanage uh, available to uh, black uh, children. And who had a vested interest in that was Susan Dana. So uh, what we'd like to see is, you know, really tie our history together, do a better job of really making those linkages and then connecting our community, especially with the east and the west, and uh, doing so as, a, as much as possible. But uh, you're right, with regards to the Realtor Association, they are interested in uh, doing something, especially with their anniversary year and what that would be. So, of course, they're interested in the YWCA. The proposal I was kind of intrigued by was Seth Mullins where he really, uh, he proposed lopping off the gym and the pool. And what that does is it really opens up the view. And the reason he said take that down is because from a, uh, a, a rehabilitation standpoint, they're both uh, levels of the floorings, uh, they're not equal. You know, they're not, they're, you have to step up from one area to the next. He thought it might have been built separately. Uh, Flaherty and Collins had the same thing. They weren't sure if it was built at the same time. So that was an interesting dynamic, and he would put a lot of the resources in there himself. So for me, that was intriguing to do something of that nature. But from a historical standpoint, you know, I'm the mayor that said, let's tear it down. And then, of course, in Springfield, that's when you get the blowback with regards to why you're tearing down that building. We need to be more proactive with our historic sites. We need to register all the buildings that are potentially uh, valuable from a historic standpoint and then we need to you know work with the individual property owners to uh, make sure they don't go into a state of distress because a lot of times what happens is someone will buy the property they sit on it and then eventually it has to come down and that I think has happened with the YWCA so those are you know a lot of things we have to take a look at but we're going to leave our options open with the Y block where we go from here is really uh, uh, we've asked Flaherty and Collins to provide additional information um, at this point in time, uh, I'm not sold on any project. I could see even a potential for piecemealing a project together sure. because uh, Flaherty is asking for, I think their shortfall is $17 million. And I, I told him, I said, you know, if, if local developers knew $17 million was on the table, they, they would have said, well, we would have came to the table. So that's what we have to take a look at as well. Very good. The uh, growth of the medical community has been tremendous. Um, particularly the two major hospitals and, and a lot of the uh, outlying and, and connected activities. Uh, at the same time, the medical district, which is now I think the Mid-Illinois Medical District, uh, in my opinion, has been a total disappointment, uh, even though we probably didn't know what it was supposed to do to start with. Uh, it certainly hadn't done anything, so, uh, so forth. Could you, could you talk about why or why not the city ought to take a much greater interest in the medical district mm -hmm. as is. You have appointments on there, the governor has appointments. Uh, the, the, the medical community is going to grow no matter what mm -hmm. and is growing, mm -hmm. growing very nicely uh, and will impact the community for years and years mm -hmm. to come. Would you talk a little bit about where you see the medical community going and whether some, some emphasis on the medical district uh, would be needed. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, first on the medical district, uh, that was created so there would be uh, hopefully support from the state, which hasn't happened like they supported Chicago. So uh, the director of uh, economic development for the state uh, said a uh, small gathering. They asked what, we could, what he could take back to the governor, and that's one of the things I brought up is funding like they funded the Chicago uh, uh, Medical District because you look at uh, Springfield and what the uh, Memorial SIU School of Medicine and St. John's has been able to do, it's phenomenal, and they did it pretty much on their own, and we appreciate their leadership. But, you know, we have one of the uh, rare opportunities to promote the Learning and Innovative Center. It's one of six in the country. And so uh, this is one of the tie-ins is with regards to economic development and tourism. We should be bringing every medical conference there is to Springfield because it's affordable um, with regards to, uh, you know, we have a great medical facility. We're on the cutting edge, especially with SIU School of Medicine. The Learning and Innovative Center is one of six in the country. And then the other side of it is we have Lincoln to tie-in. So if uh, individuals, when they go to conferences, usually they look at bringing their families along. It's a natural tie-in. So that's the direction we're going to take is try to match up uh, tourism with economic development. But that's one of those targeted uh, sectors on industry that we should be uh, maximizing. So what the city can do, and the chamber's doing it on a broader base, uh, like a shotgun approach, I'd rather see something in a more succinct nature where we uh, sit down with the leaders of, uh, of all the medical facilities and really find out what's prohibiting their growth uh, besides the state budget, because if they, you know, if the state did have their budget in place, uh, I think there's uh, tens of millions, I think it's like a $70 million project waiting, but the state's so far behind in the medical payments that it's lagged, you know, it's stalled those projects. So we need to find out what's prohibiting their growth, how we can uh, expand it, what are their targeted areas, or what businesses can complement theirs, and those are the entities we should be going after. Uh, since the new uh, underpass on Carpenter Street will be done sometime this mm -hmm. uh, fairly soon, August, mid-August, uh, has the city given any thought when, it, when you come up going west out of the underpass mm -hmm. and you get on Carpenter and you enter the medical district? Is there any thought given to making Carpenter kind of a very receptive boulevard concept, uh, and the same way on possible signage or? Uh, designation of a medical district. Have been any discussions within your arena on mm -hmm. things like that? Well, my discussions mainly focus on the Rail Street corridor, and uh, but as far as uh, I'm sure that's going to take place, we'll uh, work with St. John's. I know they have a building project that they're going forward with, so uh, that's right in that general vicinity. But that was the importance of the Salvation Army uh, project with. Uh, working with Horace Mann, and just so you know, I'm the one, I'm the guilty party that brought it to the forefront, uh, but really it makes sense to open up that corridor for development, and that's a way we can help cement one of our major employers, Horace Mann, their presence here in Springfield, because we're in competition with other communities. They have offices in Dallas, Texas, as well as Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, you know, those are heavyweights with regards to economic development, so Springfield, we wanted to cement that relationship uh, with Salvation Army and when we would need uh, potential access to some of the properties, it really uh, jeopardizes their uh, project with regards to uh, putting millions of dollars into that. So, uh, you know, I approached them, they agreed to move, and it's really been a win-win in the opening up that whole corridor for the intermodal hub and development. But the other side of the beautification, you know, as, uh, it came up with the Salvation Army discussion going to Gold's Gym, is the corridor for Clear Lake. And so uh, there's others that have mentioned that. And what we want to do is probably, that's probably for me, that's probably a, a higher priority uh, to get that looking better. So, you know, people know that we are interested in investing in all areas of our community. Very good. Uh, the last couple of years, there's been a lot of discussion on creating a locally an inspector general office. Mm -hmm. uh, we would be the only city outside of Chicago with an inspector general office. In the meanwhile, about every city in the state has a local city planner mm -hmm. or more. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've had no discussion, uh, mm -hmm. seeming or very little discussion. Mm -hmm. Our program last month actually was on urban city planning. Would you talk a little bit about your views on city planning, mm -hmm. whether, uh, whether the potential of a, of a uh, city planner is in the, mm -hmm. in the possible range? Mm -hmm. and? Uh, where you might be on that. Personally, uh, 
on city planning, I think that's a larger aspect than one individual. Sure. I think you have to hang your hat on where succession happens. And I think that's where city's planning gone awry. So it depends on who comes into the mayor's office, how that planning goes. So we've had uh, discussions with UIS and possibly uh, partnering in that regards because what I could foresee is with that partnership is having them maybe provide their expertise, especially through uh, the University of Illinois on the planning concept. But then you have students that would be interested in that uh, bringing new ideas as opposed to you know an individual uh, a bureaucrat in the city government doing it. So sure. I'd rather see more livelier ideas uh, on an ongoing basis. You don't have to worry about succession if you partner with higher education. So that's the direction that I'd like to take personally and that's what we're going to pursue. Um, but uh, with regards to uh, planning, you know, I talked to Director Mahoney. He said, well, it depends on what your view of a plan planner is. You know, we do have a position that we pos uh, posted, and uh, that's what they would deal with. But that's more of, you know, looking at architectural renderings, things of that nature, up in the public works office, uh, approving permits, things of that nature. But really, the direction we'll take is uh, trying to partner with higher education in that regards. Very good. Uh Let's go back to railroad relocation. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came here a long time ago, there was a railroad relocation committee, mm -hmm. and about the time we really needed them, it got disbanded. <laughs> uh, now, over the last few years, it would have been nice to have a railroad mm -hmm. relocation committee. Uh, uh, tell us the progress you think is being made on the 10th Street corridor and, uh, and the effect mm -hmm. on Springfield. Well, uh, that's probably one that, next to CWP, that's been the area that I've probably dealt right. with most, uh, meeting-wise. And what's been frustrating, you never had all the entities around the table with regards to the railroads, especially uh, the FRA. Uh, you're dealing with the feds and the uh, state as well. But w the progression has really gone leaps and bounds, uh, really because of uh, we did take to the governor the importance of the 10th Street corridor. He lives near the tracks, uh, especially at being at the mansion. But without his support, uh, I don't think we would have had the IDOT agreement. And so once he did throw his support behind it, uh, we did have that uh, agreement come, which really outlines the direction we need to take with a financial commitment to do additional underpasses with regards to Madison and Jefferson Street, as well as uh, Laurel and Ash. So uh, we are moving in a positive direction. What I think the important vote that the council took with regards to the Intermodal Hub, the Salvation Army, uh, wherever you fell on that side of the tracks, is that it really helped uh, show the commitment of Springfield and the county uh, the desire to move along with that, uh, that uh, rail corridor. But that's been discussed a long time. Uh, when I was on downtown Springfield back in the 90s, that's when I first heard about high-speed rail. And, uh, you know, I think the high-speed rail aspect was just a, you know, everybody would like that concept, but really what it comes down to is moving freight. I mean, that, it's, that's what's driving the entity. And actually, I think the feds actually, or the FRA actually, you know, got away from the term high-speed rail uh, just like a year or two ago. So that, for me, that was a monumental step that really they finally acknowledged that really it's about moving freight. Uh, it will help for the other rail uh, transportation with regards to passenger rail, but I think it's moving at least with that IDOT agreement. I think that helps move it along that much further and shows local commitment, state commitment to the federal government so they will have additional resources, hopefully receive our Tiger Grant in the fall with regards to that rail project. Very good. One more question on transportation. Mm -hmm. 11th Street extension. Mm -hmm. What the hell is going on? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a timetable on that? <laughs> well, well, hopefully it's what the heavens going on because my dad, my dad was the, I think the first one that started that 11th Street project and it might have been when he was either streets commissioner or when it was mayor, but I think it was when it was streets commissioner. So it's been going on that long. Uh, but it is, uh, what's, what I've learned is any road project of that magnitude, once they say it's going to be done, it takes two years to build. Like the underpasses, it's always two years, $20 million. And that's you know, <laughs> boggling to me, but that's how it is, it seems like. But with regards to 11th Street, they are putting it out for bid uh, this summer. And then they said, well, it'll take two years to get completed. So uh, we'll see how that progresses. But it will be done within that two-year time frame. So they're looking at 2018. Very good. Uh, Kind of last question from me, and then we'll open up to, to the audience. Uh, you see Springfield potentially at least as a model city. Mm -hmm. You talk about mm -hmm. that. Uh, 
what are some short-term ideas specifically maybe this next year mm -hmm. and uh, a little longer term, at least the first four years, mm -hmm. uh, that you'd like to get accomplished? Mm -hmm. Well, on the immediate order would be residency. I'm a big proponent of residency. Uh, we put a lot of resources. We have great paying jobs. Actually, their career positions pay great uh, paying jobs with great benefits. And that's kind of upside down. When I came from the private sector as treasurer, uh, you know, we the private sector used to have the great paying jobs, and that's why government paid the great benefits. Well, now it's flipped, where they get both. So, uh, you know, that's why it's important to have residency, especially since uh, over 100% of our property taxes uh, goes towards retirement. So that's important from that aspect. The other thing we're working on is an agreement, uh, you know, with our capital improvement projects, where we would have a local labor preference. And so we're working on that. And the importance of that is right now, you know, we're pouring in resources for capital projects, but there's no guarantee that, uh, you know, no true partnership that would benefit residents of Springfield. So we've had conversations recently, you know, it was on the docket, it was tabled uh, because of, you know, it was too broad. And we're working right now uh, with a couple of the unions to see how we can really uh, help with a qualified workforce because what we heard, especially with residency, is uh, you know some of them did get up and say, well, we don't have qualified workers, you know, to draw from the pool. So we should change that, and that's been the same argument, and that's been the benefit of having my dad in this position because I, those are the same arguments that worked decades right. ago. So really, I look at a leadership going forward. We need to change that dynamic with regards to uh, the direction we want to take. I'd rather be a leader, and I'll give you an example with regards to recruitment or uh, drawing people into Springfield for those qualified jobs. I had a conversation with the police chief, and they had a lot of applicants come forward, but on the minority applicants, uh, some of them didn't come back for the test. And he goes, I don't understand that because, you know, on, it might have been because of the pre-qual test that they did, they weren't that successful. So he thought that might have been a mechanism why they didn't come. So I said, well, why don't we take them, you know, get them and train them and, you know, try to help improve their success. And he said, well, nobody ever does that. And I said, chief, that's music to my ears. I'd rather be on the forefront than being a follower with regards to that. And I think that's the direction Springfield needs to take. You pointed out the medical community, our educational community. They are leaders in our community, really uh, making things happen. It's time government. Uh, does the same thing and taking a leadership role and looking proactively towards the future, how we can uh, make our city, working with others, a better place. Very good. Uh, I'm going to open it up to questions, and uh, there is another mic. Did, did, uh, who, who has it? Very good. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Uh, we will open it up to the audience. Uh, questions for the mayor. Surely you have a question for the mayor. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Kevin? Mr. Mayor, can you talk a little bit about the importance of uh, small businesses, startups, et cetera, to the community, and also the city's efforts to uh, improve their chances of success? Sure. Uh, one thing we did initially was uh, we try to plug a gap. What government should do is try to facilitate growth. You know, we're not the economic driver. So we should identify deficiencies in our community. And one was, thanks to Karen Davis, you know, she's the economic development director I brought in uh, for the specific fact to help turn around areas that need it most. She was in community development like I was for the bank. Uh, those of you that might be familiar with Community Reinvestment Act, that's what we focused on. But one of the things she brought to the table is the Justine Peterson uh, program, where they're the, uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, micro lender in the country. And so, uh, what we did is called the banks and you know coming from the banking community it was easy and what it showed to me is the influence that the mayor's office has i called uh, you know i invited all the banks and the majority then did show up and actually invested and created a pool of funds available to individuals that would not traditionally qualify for a bank loan so they might be at one time qualified or may not have but this uh, pool of funds was available to them uh, we have a individual from justine peterson in our office but uh, that program, in its short time frames, uh, we put out probably over 50 loans right now. And uh, the intent is to get those small businesses bankable. And so it also gives the banks an opportunity to not, you know, if they can't help someone, they can say, well, we can't help you today, but here's a program you can go to and uh, work with others in regards to that. So 
that's from a small aspect, that's what we need to look at. Uh, the other side of it is with the Chamber of Commerce, Local First, they're great uh, advocates for small businesses, but we need to be as supportive as possible. Uh, some of the, uh, the direction I'd like to see that we haven't taken yet, that I mentioned in the campaign, is having a, a more of a broad-based uh, leadership or, I guess, certified lenders, not only from the private sector but the public sector as well. So it wouldn't matter where the individual would go in for financial help, that the individual could talk about, you know, opportunities with regards to public financing or private financing. So it's, you know, kind of allowing banks to be a one-stop shop for financial services, uh, that they would know about city programs or government programs available, and then vice versa where our individuals in economic development would be able to do the same. Questions? Mayor, I'm a member of the uh, Advisory Council for the Coalition on Dismantling Racism. I know that uh, dismantling racism was a high priority of the prior administration, and uh, I think that you have, have taken up that battle of uh, dismantling a culture of racism and systemic racism within the city government. Could you talk some about uh, what your efforts and plans are on that subject? Mm -hmm. Sure, and uh, I think uh, the opportunity you're talking about is what Mayor Houston had brought in, is a uh, focus on dismantling racism uh, with regards to crossroads training, and we continue that. Uh, he started the Diversity Council, which we have, but um, what we're trying to build upon is uh, that uh, knowledge and uh, improve things. And that's what I'm trying to do as mayor is you change processes as you're here because you're just here for a short period of time and then it's time to go. But what you hope is that the next administration builds on what you've done. And it's important for, especially in racism, uh, that we do that. You know, we're the home of Abraham Lincoln, so we should be the model city with regards to that. You know, we have Lincoln, we have uh, President Barack Obama, and then we have the uh, race riots that led to the uh, formation of the NAACP. No other city in the country has as much impact of racism that Springfield, Illinois has had, not only for the country, the state, but also the world. And so it's really important for us to uh, be the model so we can show others how, how important it is to embrace your history, learn from it, and move forward. So, you know, one of the things I did have, uh, you know, which is interesting in the debates, was I, you know, deemed myself the diversity director because uh, the opposition wanted to hire a diversity director. And I said, well, it really starts at the top. The mayor has the influence, they can, you know, uh, have their directors do what needs to be done, but anything, especially with regards to racism, should come up to the mayor's uh, uh, office, that highest level of office, so they can address it. Well, you know, if you put your shoes in some of the minorities' case, they said, well, you know, you don't understand. Uh, they wanted someone there 24-7 focusing on that item. But, uh, you know, and that, that's a you know, legitimate argument. But we've uh, focused on a second review process for applicants because that's been the great pushback is we don't have enough minorities in uh, the government. And so we put in the second review uh, aspect and that's really helped us hire a couple minorities that would have slept, uh, slipped through the cracks. So uh, you know we are working on those initiatives and really uh, cementing those relationships. Uh, uh, police chief Winslow's done a great job interacting with the community but it's just not the police chief. It's the police department, it's utility, it's public works, it's all of us uh, working together. And that's why it's important for this uh, Salvation Army uh, you know, community center, you know, hopefully they call it the Springfield Community Center, because that will be looked upon not only by individuals uh, throughout the community, but specifically in that neighborhood. How is that going to impact that area? And so it's incumbent upon us to really change the dynamics of that area, but that's one that's going to be under the microscope and uh, hopefully there'll be good things to come from that. One more. What is, what's the status of the funding for the Laurel Street uh, underpass and all the other underpasses that are required? Well, the uh, state of Illinois, they have, uh, with the IDOT agreement, they've committed uh, up to, I think it's uh, over $70 million towards those projects. But the important gap to fill is uh, what we applied for on the Tiger Grant. And that specifically addresses Laurel and Ash. So uh, we hope to get an answer back by hopefully this fall on whether we are awarded that. The other piece of that is, I think it's around $2 million, will be for design work for the Intermodal Hub. So uh, hopefully that is. Uh, approved and then we can move forward in a 
expeditious manner with regards to those two underpasses and they uh, work with regards to the intermodal hub. We've got a little more time. Any more questions? Yes. I would, I would be interested in an update on the ward meetings and the reports and what's going on in regards to uh, things by ward. Mm -hmm. And my other thought was, um, when you look at the impact of, uh, like for example, Enos Neighborhood Association, mm -hmm. um, whether or not there's a way to help other neighborhoods get organized with that and whether there's a role for the city to kind of take a lead or educate or, or help have other grassroots organizations have an impact on the community in that way. Mm -hmm. Well, with regards to the ward plans, we held those and then uh, I was hoping to have it in June, uh, but with the summer months, uh, that's not going to happen. It'll probably be August, September, so that'll be the follow-up. We have compiled uh, the results of that where those have come in handy. So you can go on the city's website. We do, did revamp the website. A lot of the input that we received from the ward meetings led to that, uh, listing neighborhood associations. So uh, Juan Huerta, the community relations director, is working with neighborhoods to do the grassroots effort, how to form a, a, a neighborhood association. But you're right, with regards to Zenas Park, they could be the model that we can utilize. And that's what uh, we want to work with them a little bit more than what we have on the housing initiatives and really uh, have uh, you know fine-tuned things a little bit, but that's one that we should use as a model for others that want to uh, change their particular areas. So uh, uh, the other thing is we did have, I think they're gonna hand this out, this is a year in review, uh, so you can take a look at that, but uh, those award plans uh, where it's come in handy, we have partnered with the uh, Regional Planning Commission. Uh, that Norm Sims and his staff is looking at our comprehensive plan and we're updating that, and they use those uh, award plans to really succinct uh, some initiatives that were uh, came across all the wards in some uh, specific areas and those are going to be implemented into the plan as well. Any more? I want to make uh, announce, an announcement I forgot to make earlier. Monday evening at the Sangamo Club, the BGA Better Government Association and the Citizens Club have a session on the impact of the impasse, I think it's called. It's at 4.30 at Sangamo. Uh, it is free, open to the public. Uh, it's and 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock, I'm sorry. And, uh, and Jim's involved, right? And so forth. So uh, get that plug in. It should be about five speakers, six speakers. It should be excellent program. With that, I know the mayor's got a busy schedule this morning. We sincerely thank you for joining us this morning and uh, certainly hope the best for you in the city of Springfield. Same here, thank, thank you, you for the invite, appreciate it Bob. <laughs>